Good evening, everybody. So you people waited for me to reach here before you started clapping back. <laughs> um, I really don't know how to, I don't know what to say after all the people that have come before me. <laughs> I'm even tempted to change my short story to a comic act. You know, there, there's something about, I don't know how many of us know Maya Angelou's Till I Rise. There's something about that poem that reminds me of Ije Bugari. It's like the Jebugari says, you might put water in me and run to the kitchen to get sugar and milk, I rise. <laughs> you might run back to the parlor and you see that I'm up to the top of the plate and you drink me hurriedly, but still, I rise. <laughs> you might hurriedly put me down into your belly, knowing that you're not going to finish the quantity and in your belly, there I go, rising. <laughs> Um, I have a short story this evening, and my short story is titled, Like a Sister. I hope you enjoy it. Brothers and sisters, I wish to tell you a story. Please listen carefully. This story is about the friend zone, that special place where a guy who is romantically eyeing a babe and vice versa is relegated like a low-ranking football club. <laughs> when referring to a person, the object of the affection, who is in this zone, someone might say things like, you're like one of my guys, or you're like a male girlfriend, <laughs> or someday you will make some woman proud. <laughs> my name is Edima Apan, and once upon a time, I lived in the friend zone. In fact, I was the chair lady of the National Association of Friend Zone. <laughs> my journey to that place began a few months after my 13th birthday. It was the day we had new neighbors move in next door. And as with every new arrival to our part of Garden Estate, nearly everyone was curious about the newcomers. Some of the neighbors went to help them move in. The children, like myself, watched from behind the low fences that demarcated each plot. I watched as four children came down from the back of the moving truck, which held various household furniture. They looked so happy, laughing and shoving each other. Later, I would find out their names were Eric, Ubong, Ama, Ikanke, and their parents were Mr. and Mrs. Baraswene. Why are you the only one in your family with an English name? This was the first question I asked Eric when we became friends two days later. I was born in the UK and my parents christened me a deacon, he said. I guess whoever was filling the form on my birth certificate wasn't listening because instead of a deacon, she wrote Erica on my birth certificate. My parents found it funny and had it changed but chose to keep Eric on as my first name. Unlike some of our neighbors who rented their homes and moved away after a few years, the Baraswenes had bought theirs and would stay on for a long time. It wasn't long before Eric and I became inseparable. At first, our parents worried about our closeness and Mama would often call me into her room and give me many lectures on the harmful effects of raging hormones and the honor in keeping one's virginity. Papa wasn't so subtle. He teased me endlessly and often remarked on how he would prefer an in-law who lived close by. <laughs> As the last child, my siblings were protective, but never intrusive. His family, they had no fears at all. Our teenage years soon gave way to young adulthood. We went off to different universities, but remained closer than ever. Then one day, after the second semester exams, which heralded the end of my third year, I went home for the long vacation. As was our practice, Eric and I met under one of the mango trees that lined both sides of the avenue leading into the estate. When I saw him, something funny happened in my stomach. It felt like a bird was flying inside, up my chest, obstructing my breath. There was something different about him, something manlier. Ah, you now have some meat on your bones, oh, he teased, pinching my arm. 
Eh, and I can see that your eyebrows have come down for a drink, I replied, pointing at the thin line of hair that circled his mouth and chin. We spent the next five minutes throwing verbal jabs back and forth. I marveled at his voice, which had deepened into a smooth, silky baritone, just like his father's. Eh, do you remember Siphon Nathaniel? She was in your class in Marek Secondary School. Of course I do, I replied, surprised at the question. Who could, who could forget Siphon? She had been the most beautiful girl in our class. Womanly cops have found her body while most of us girls were still fasting and praying for the semblance of a bosom. It came as no surprise when she engaged all the attention of all the boys. It also came as no surprise that all the girls hated her. <laughs> Why did you ask me about Siphon? I asked. Well, he said, taking a deep breath, she's in my school and we're seeing each other. I felt like I had been punched in the gut. This feeling was immediately followed by confusion because I couldn't understand the sudden surge of anger and jealousy. The bird was gone from my tummy and in its place was a heavy ball of misery. Are you alright? He asked, staring at me with worry. Oh, oh, of course I am. Why, why would I not be? Eh, I'm happy for you, but, but, but why didn't you tell me? On and on I babbled, trying to cover the mixed emotions and the tremblings in my hand. I'm sorry. It's just that it was so new and I wanted to keep it to myself for a while, he said. I was miserable that vacation. For Siphon became a part of nearly all our weekly activities. Sometimes they even hung out without me. I'd never felt so betrayed. I'm so happy that my two best girls are getting along, Eric remarked one day. <laughs> Siphon was such a nice person, which made things worse, for I had no reason to hate her. I tried to be happy for them, really, I did. But whenever I saw them together, my face became like sour egusi soup. <laughs> the kind that had not been warmed for 40 days and 40 nights. If they ever looked in my direction, I would suddenly smile until the sun bleached my teeth. <laughs> in all this, I had no one to turn to except my friend Margaret. I need to do something about them, I told her one day, towards the end of the vacation. We're in her room watching a rerun of Law and Order. What do you want to do and why, she asked, carefully applying blue nail polish to her big toe. It's Eric. I love him. I love him and I can't stand to see her with him. Hey, now you're talking. Shebe was asking you about this thing and you lied to me. That's not important, Margaret. What do you think I should do? I asked. She said I should tell him how I felt. I balked at that suggestion for I was afraid. What if he didn't like me too? Wouldn't that make things awkward? I wasn't ready to risk our friendship. Eh, then you'll never know now. See, just tell him the truth. Let's see what he has to say. Even if he doesn't like you back, we'll come up with another plan. Eh, we can even call it Operation Take Back Your Bay. <laughs> Filled up with Margaret's motivational speech and a strong desire to win my man's heart, I set out next door to claim him. But he had gone out. So I called him on the phone and I said, could we hang out at the beach? And he said, yes. I got there first. He showed up an hour later. Wow, someone is looking extra pretty today. What's the occasion? He said, plunking down beside me. I blushed. I can't remember what we talked about, maybe about school. But I remember that before I could lose my nerves, I looked up at his handsome angular face and I said, Eric, I like you. <laughs> eh, I like you too. In fact, I like you past my mama, he joked. <laughs> Don't be such a clown, I said. What I meant was, I like you like you. You know, like a girl likes a boy. Seconds ticked by. I could hear the sounds of crickets chirping. <laughs> he said nothing. I stared at the sand. Then in a quiet, gentle voice, he said, 
Thank you, Edima. But you know, I see you like my sister. <laughs> my brothers and sisters, in that moment, I learned a valuable lesson, a universal truth, that it is better for someone to look at you and say, you're like my guy, or you're like one of the girls. But if the person ever says you're like my sister, my dear, you will never, ever leave the friend zone. Thank you.